Hello everybody and welcome back to our lecture series. I'm Ted, your host, and for this lecture we're going, to, we're going to continue right along with our look at the career of Philip II of Macedon. So in our last career, uh, in our last lecture, we uh, we examined the end of the Peloponnesian War. We saw the adaptation that Sparta had to make, um, uh, which primarily consisted of just branching out and building a fleet and challenging the Athenians on the seas to bring. Uh, to bring about a favorable resolution in their conflict, uh, we also saw the fact we also saw that Sparta lost her hegemony within about 30 years, a little more than 30 years uh, after uh, after assuming hegemony of the Greek world. Uh, they lost it to the Thebans, and the Thebans cemented their control over the Greek world by <coughs> by freeing the Hela population, the the, uh, the the enslaved Mycenaeans that the Spartan uh, state kept control of, and primarily used to bolster and to uh, ensure that the Spartans were able to devote all of their time to military training. Uh, now the period of Theban hegemony does not last long either, had the Thebans sort of elude their hold on the Greek world with the Battle of Mantinea. Uh, with the Battle of Mantinea, the Greek world is exhausted, the Theban, the great Theban leader Epandemonius is killed, and uh, the Greek world is sort of fractured with a number of city-states uh, vying for control of the region. Now, uh, shifting from there, we, we, we moved uh, to Macedon. We looked at the composite nature of the kingdom of Macedon. We looked at the troubles that uh, faced all of the kings who, who ruled from, uh, from either Pella or Agai. Um, and and we, also look at, we also looked at the, uh, the situation that confronted Philip II as he returned to Macedon. The Illyrians were massing on the borders. The Thracians were threatening the borders. And there was internal disorder. Had the had the king, his elder brother Perdiccas the third, had just been killed. Uh, so there was no great royal figure within Macedon. Uh, Philip's nephew was an infant, um, and the Athenians had just landed troops on uh, on the borders of Macedon proper. Uh, we we saw Philip use wily diplomacy and uh, and 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 a very skillful uh, use of his army to. Uh, one, defeat the Athenians and then make a conciliatory peace with them to serve as Athens' muscle in the North Aegean. We see him simply bribe off the Thracians, and we see him uh, marry an Illyrian princess to buy temporary peace before moving the Macedonian army up north and smashing the Illyrians in a battle. Now, after the peace with Athens, uh, and really after all, of those things, uh, after all of those events, Philip enhanced his and Macedon's regional prominence in the north. Prominence in the North Aegean, um, the peace with Athens made Macedon the Athenian muscle in the region, and keeping and, and they were and, and Macedon and Philip were were really tasked with simply keeping the Athenian vassals in the North Aegean in line. Now, Philip, in quick order. He began to simply secure these cities of the North Aegean for himself. Uh, he captured the city of Amphipolis, which was home to some very lucrative gold and silver mines. The mines furnished uh, Philip with the means to reorganize the Macedonian army and to reorganize, restructure the royal capitals of the, of the, uh, of the Argeides. Now, Philip went on to build the Argeid Royal Center at Pella. Uh, he transformed it from a royal village to a first-class Greek-style polis. Philip recruited architects and artists from all over the Greek world to come to Pella to build temples, theaters, and to create these beautiful mosaics. Philip brought philosopher from, at, uh, from, from the Greek world to Macedon, and he establishes an academy to educate the children of the Macedonian elite. Uh, the rejuvenation of Pella gave Macedon a cultural and political focal point really for the first time, uh, and, and it was really helpful uh, in uniting the kingdom and giving the kingdom a national identity. Now, the school the school was really a clever ruse for Philip. Uh, it gave Philip access to the heirs of the Macedonian nobility. Uh, his ruse was that the children will be sent there and they'll be educated amongst his children. They will be educated by the greatest, uh, by the greatest and the best teachers in the Greek world. But what it really did was it placed all those children, uh, the heirs of the Macedonian nobility, into Philip's hands. Philip could now use them as hostages to secure their father's good behaviors in the future. Uh, the sort of, sort of martial lords, the border lords, they, they can no longer refuse to really um, decide to follow the will or the dictum of the king at Pella or Agai. They had to, they had to toe uh, the line with the Macedonian kings. Now, these young noblemen, 
lead these young nobles, they grew up at the childhood friends of Philip's children. Uh, and, and this also served to link the future generation of Macedonian leaders together with longstanding ties of, of uh, friendship. Um, this, this really uh, was served to unite the future king with his aristocracy. It was a kind of an unintended consequences, uh, an, un, uh, uh, an unintended consequence, but one that would prove, uh, prove beneficial in the future campaigns of the Macedonian state. Now, the next phase of Philip's career saw him purchase supporters throughout the Greek world, uh, Thessaly, uh, but particularly in Thessaly and in Corinth. Uh, he went out to purchase. Um, supporters. And Philip even took it upon himself to intervene in the Thessalian Civil War, uh, successfully fielding an army that conquers Thessaly. Now, Philip at this point is appointed the Tagus of the Thessalian League, uh, and that was simply that he was simply uh, the commander of the Thessalian League. And this gave him access to the best cavalry in the Greek world. Thessaly is home to uh, a lot of pastures, and, and from those pastures, the, the, the uh, Thessalians raised cavalry corps. Um, it's really the uh, the only real area uh, in, in the Aegean world, uh, in, in the Greek world, where you could you know have large bodies of cavalry. Now, at this point, Philip was still thought of as a minor barbarian threat by most Greeks, uh, with the exception of the Mothenes of Athens. Uh, the Mothenes of Athens, he sees Philip for what he is, and after the Thessalian War, Philip signs a new treaty with the Athenians, which secures the grain supply for Athens on terms much more favorable to Philip. Now, this is a preparatory move by Philip in anticipation of a final campaign against the Greeks. Now, Philip uh, was, able, was able to enforce his will at home and abroad because he created a military corps devoted to the Argii dynasty and this army was a truly professional body in every sense of the word. word. It had professional soldiers who were imbued with this patriotic love towards Macedon and towards their king. Philip used the Macedonian army to refocus the loyalties of the Macedonian peoples towards his royal house. He transformed the nobility of Macedon into an aristocracy of service rather than those semi-independent feudal lords uh, that, uh, that, that have really largely defined the Macedonian ability up until this point. Now, Philip rearmed the Macedonian cavalry with a heavy with, uh, with heavy armor and with helmets. He retrained the cavalry to use thrusting spears. He turned them into lancer corps, um, and and, it, and, he, and this really changed their function on uh, during during battle during engagement. Now, uh, Philip introduced fighting in tight formation. He incorporated a unit from Cephali into the Macedonian army, and the Macedonian cavalry became a striking force that was used to flank the enemy uh, and, and really just take the enemy from the rear. Now, the infantry. Uh, the infantry was where Philip made his greatest military innovations. Um, the Macedonian army was reimagined uh, through, through the lens of the classic Greek hoplite formation, uh, and what Philip created is known as the phalanx. Um, the Macedonian phalanx was 16 ranks deep, uh, he armed, he rearmed the infantrymen with a longer spear. It was really a pike. Uh, it's known as the Sarissa, and it was equipped, uh, and he equipped them with new shields. He did away with the heavy armor uh, in the front, in the, and, and, uh, and one of the things that made the Macedonian phalanx so, uh, so, so different was that he had the, the first six ranks all hold their spears out forward. So you had six ranks of men holding out their their, uh, their their spears forward, while the back ten ranks held their spears upright at diagonal angles, and this was done so that they would be able to block any incoming missiles. Uh, Philip also introduced new types of soldiers, uh, soldier contingents to the Macedonian army, and and all of the light armed skirmishers. Uh, that 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 um that he brought in were really used to guard against cavalry charges and to break up and to help break up enemy formations. The 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 new skirmishers were hydraspis, archers, slingers, and of course peltasts. And, and Philip improved the logistical system of the Macedonian army as well, and this allowed his army to operate in far off campaigns more efficiently. Uh, Philip also introduced the, the siege engines into the Macedonian army, and this allowed his army to simply besiege cities. So, where has the, the Greeks? The Greeks never really learned to, to besiege cities. Um, they, they did not really have a grasp for it. Um, what, uh, what, what, what they were able to do was... 
um, what, what they were really, uh, what the Macedonian army was able to do was to the two cities. He was able to uh, to destroy the walls. He was able to overrun the city uh, and, and take them. That that was uh, another major accomplishment of Philip's military reform to to uh, to allow the Macedonian to develop these techniques and to uh, to and to incorporate that tactic into their repertoire. The Macedonian army of Philip was also constructed to annihilate the enemy on the battlefield. Um, he, he was doing away with the Greek concept of of uh, simply driving the enemy from the field. He was removing the threat from the field once and for all. That was a goal of Philip's. Now, Philip formed, uh, he reformed this army, and he formed this army to fight in a definitive Macedonian way. Uh, he introduced the new, what I would like to call the Macedonian way of war to, uh, to, the, to the Greek, first to the Greek world, and it would later be exported throughout the Near East by his son. Uh, now, the Sarissa, the, the Sarissa was really what made the Macedonian army uh, the most dominant force uh, of its era. The Sarissa was twice as long as the Greek spear. It had a counterweight on the end, and that, and that counterweight was for balance. And the Sarissa also required heavy drilling and training to operate. With this new mixed army, Philip now intrudes into the Greek into the Greek world into Greek politics at will, and Philip's first opportunity came uh, when the Greek um, when the Greek sacred site of Delphi was seized by the Phocians. Uh, Delphi was a national shrine. It was one of the two great. Uh, excuse me, sorry about that. Uh, Delphi was one of the two great national shrines in the Greek world. Uh, the other, of course, being Olympias. Philip, in his role as Tagus of, of uh, the, the Thessalian League, he marches south with the intention of expelling the Phocians from Delphi. On his march south, he is opposed at Thermopylae in 350 BCE by the Athenians. Philip withdraws from Greece in the face of the Athenian opposition. Uh, Athens was really in no position to fight Philip's or, or, or couldn't really even contest Philip's army. Uh, but, but, but Thermopylae was a uh, strategic hold. That was where uh, Xerxes would check by 300 Spartans um, before he used a goat path, a, a goat track, to, uh, catch, to um, catch them off guard and attack them in the rear. But, but, but the Athenians check him there, and Philip is forced to retreat. Um, uh, Athens, by 350, had long passed from being an imperial power or really a credible military threat. Philip teased out the negotiations until he had actually taken control of Delphi for himself. And Delphi signals to the Greeks that Philip is the new Xerxes. Philip II of Macedon is the new Xerxes, the first of Persia. Um, Macedon under Philip replaces the Persians as the new threat to Greek security. In 341 BCE, Philip begins his final campaigns. Uh, he be he Philip attacks. He, uh, he begins uh, attacking cities like Byzantium and the Black Sea region, and, and then this leads to Athens declaring war on him. Byzantium uh, was a region that was vital to the Athenians because it was uh, one of the bread baskets for the, for the Greek world. It was a great bread basket for Athens. By attacking Byzantium, Philip was again encroaching on the Athenian grain supply to, to use that, that the access to grain has political leverage to force the Athenians into accepting his, his dictums. Now, uh, the Athenians declare war on Macedon in 338 BCE. The Athenians and the Thebans form an alliance to oppose Philip. Philip, in response, mobilizes the Macedonian army and he moves rapidly, penetrating deep into the Greek heartland. He moves, uh, he moves his army, positions his army right outside of the city of Thebes at a place called Chironia. Now, the Macedonians in the ensuing battle crushed the Greek alliance. The Macedonian victory effectively marked the end of Greek independence until the Greek War of Independence in the, in the 19th century. Um, so for nearly 2,000 years afterwards, the, the Greeks are a subject people. Philip now assumes the direct role of hegemon of the Greek world, and he begins enrolling all of the Greek cities, with the exception of Sparta, into his new league. Uh, the Spartans would not be cowed, the Spartans were defeated, but they were not uh, defeated to the point that they would simply give up their freedom, their autonomy, and they live outside of this new Greek, uh, Greek, um, Greek league, this new Greek, uh, 
political reorganization. The New League uh, signs a treaty with Macedon, and this allows Philip to act as the leader and supreme military commander of an expedition to liberate the Greeks of Asia Minor. This was an audacious en en endeavor. Uh, the Spartans and every other Greek alliance uh, and hegemonic figure uh, had failed to dislodge the Greek cities of Asia Minor from Persian control. Before the campaigns into Asia Minor is set to begin, Philip decides to celebrate the wedding of, uh, of his daughter. Uh, and at this wedding, he's assassinated by a, by a courtier named Pausanias. And Pausanias was particularly uh, aggrieved because he had been abused by some, by, uh, by some Macedonians at a symposium. Uh, these Macedonian noblemen who abused him then turned him out to these stable boys to abuse. And Pausanias had a previous um, interpersonal relationship with uh, Philip, and he asked Philip for for help. And at first, Philip was uh, he was in agreement. He was like, "Oh, I will, I will see to this." Uh, Philip was going to do it until he found out who the noblemen were. And at that point, he attempts to placate Pausanias, and Pausanias could not be placated, uh, and he decides to take his vengeance out. And this is the story that is told to us. There are multiple stories about it. The assassination of Philip is a very controversial issue still to this day with a number of theories being thrown out there. But this is uh, the one that's touted has uh, had the de facto story. Uh, Philip is to tar becomes the target of Pausanias' anger and, pa and Pausanias' uh, um, he, uh, upon hearing that Philip will not punish his offenders, he stabs Philip. Uh, and the death of Philip um, the death of Philip uh, leads to a, a scene of chaos and panic. The friends of Philip's son Alexander uh, run down Pausanias and they kill him immediately. So Pausanias cannot be interviewed by Macedonian authorities, um, and, and, and that and that also sort of figures into the the, the controversy generated by Philip's death. Um, Alexander's inheritance was in question at the time, and many then and now consider him and his mother Olympias as prime suspects in the uh, in the in the uh, assassination of Philip II. Now, Philip II was by far the greatest of the Macedonian kings. He is the brightest light in the Argii dynasty. His, his accomplishments were vast and many, uh, and, and that is a controversial statement. Um, Many, many will feel that is a controversial statement in light of his son's um, Alexander's conquest. However, Philip was able to turn the perennial backwater of Macedon into the most feared and respected state in the Aegean. He was a master diplomat and he was a master general. His statecraft is attested in his ability to uh, in, in his ability to unify Macedon and to channel the forces that for so long had uh, had been held at bay, um, had, just been, had just been disrupted, he was able to channel those forces and turn Macedon, the nation, um, into uh, the kingdom that, that it had the true potential to become. Macedon becomes all of that under Philip. Philip also united the Greeks. And that is a that that is a statement that cannot be underestimated. It cannot be understated. He united the Greeks and he put them into an almost perfect permanent confederation. Now the lands of the Persian Empire had long experienced conquest, and there was an established ebb and flow of power and an acknowledgement that a superpower would emerge and that life would go on with the loss of independence. Um, in Greece, there was no such tradition. Um, and and and, uh, and uh, during the time of Philip, uh, that the very fact that Philip was able to enroll the members of the Greek uh, the Greek city states into this league, that he was able to keep them in this league, is a true testament to his state building skills. The military reforms that he initiated would remain in place in the Eastern Mediterranean until the arrival of Rome and her legions. Uh, until the Roman legions arrived, everybody who was the power used um, a variant of the Macedonian phalanx. Um, this would be true from the uh, North Aegean world all the way down to the southern shores of the Mediterranean uh, along the, the, mar the, the marshes of the Nile River. Everybody would use these, um, these military innovations spearheaded and established by Philip. Philip's legacy also includes being the father of two future kings of Macedon, Alexander III and Philip III of Macedon. Alexander III would go on to use the army built up by Philip to... Uh, he, he will go on to use the army built up by Philip 
to create one of the largest empires ever. Uh, and Philip III, he will succeed his brother and become one of the most unlikely candidates for... Uh, he will go on to become one of the more unlikely candidates um, to succeed to the to the Macedonian throne. Now that will bring to a close our examination of Philip, um, and and I, and I I, uh, I I kind of hesitate to sort of break off um, our, our our look at Philip just yet, um, but but I will. Uh, he, um, it, it, there's a lot more that can be said about Philip, but, but we will end here and we will pick up the story, um, later. We'll pick up the story later and as always hit like, subscribe and comment. And when we come back, we will look at the, the careers of Philip's sons, um, Alexander the third, and we will close on the career of Alexander, uh, not Alexander the third, um, of, uh, of Alexander the fourth, Philip grandson, the son of Alexander the third and Philip's son, Philip the third. Uh, as always, hit like, subscribe, and comment. I hope you enjoyed this lecture. Uh, Philip is one of my favorite people of antiquity. And I will see you guys next time for another Fast Fact.